ships were towers in the sea, and their horses, tame deer. And there was even the possibility that Hernán Cortés, the leader of the conquistadors, might not be human, but an incarnation of a familiar god. Quetzalcoatl as a culture hero is said to have disappeared towards the east when in fact Cortes and the bearded foreigners arrived on the shores of the Gulf of Mexico in the early 16th century. It was uh, perceived as being a manifestation of the return of the deity Quetzalcoatl. Perhaps believing Cortes to be Quetzalcoatl, the Aztec Emperor Moctezuma sent ambassadors bearing precious gifts to greet him. A prestigious piece such as the double-headed serpent might well have been amongst this treasure. But the Spaniard was more likely to have been horrified than impressed by some of the objects presented to him. The Aztec art of this particular period is completely unlike anything going on elsewhere. What I think is very frightening about their art is that it has no interest in the individual at all. It doesn't commemorate great triumphs. It doesn't commemorate great leaders. There are no statues of powerful figures who conquered. Uh, the colonizers are never commemorated. There are no intimate portraits. There are no portraits at all, in fact. There are no images of women and babies. There are no images of children. There's nothing tender. Everything is looking towards death. And death is what awaited the Aztecs. For although Cortes accepted their gifts, his ambition was not so easily sated. Within two years, the conquistadors had effectively destroyed the city of Tenochtitlan and the Aztec Empire. The body of the Emperor Moctezuma was cast into a river. It is a society they totally fail to comprehend. The, the bloody sacrificial rituals horrify them and they react very violently against that. People are forced to march out of the city in long lines. They're searched to check they don't have any gold on them. They're branded in some cases if they're believed to have been resisting. So, at the end of the conquest itself, there's an almost utter destruction of a lot of the essentials of the Aztec civilization. And 10 years after the conquest, something like 90% of the indigenous population of Mexico have died of disease or from uh, war. All this happened to us. We saw it, we marveled at it. With this sad and mournful destiny, we saw ourselves afflicted. Gold, jade, precious raiment, quetzal feathers, everything once of value has become nothing. Some objects, the serpent among them, survived the destruction to make it back to Europe. They were curiosities, examples of the exotic, but there were those who valued their artistry. The German artist Albrecht Dürer saw a selection of the treasures in Hamburg in 1520 and wrote, I saw the things that were brought from the new land of gold, and in all the days of my life I have seen nothing which so rejoiced my heart. For I saw among them strange and exquisitely worked objects and marvelled at the subtle genius of the men in distant lands. The things I saw there I had no words to express. Even today, the double-headed serpent has the power to impress artists. Stephen Gregory has worked in mosaics, and he is attempting to unlock the secrets of the craftsmanship that so impressed Dürer. This is turquoise from southwestern America called Sleeping Beauty, Navajo, which is the same kind of turquoise that was used by the Aztecs. And it's um, a very pure, tight-grained, nice coloured turquoise. Of the two methods of cutting or 
changing the shape of the turquoise, the simplest method would be to smash it with another stone and shatter it into smaller pieces that can then be worked into the finished tiles that they used. These turquoise fragments could then have been glued onto a block of wood using a natural adhesive and sanded down until flat. Pieces of the same size would then be glued together to form blocks large enough to cut into perfect shapes using flint knives. Once cut, the glue would be dissolved in hot water to release the perfect and identical tiles. This is not a stone that would have given them huge problems. The things that would, I think would have given them problems is simply the scale that they're working with really minute pieces. Some of the pieces on the serpent are mind-bogglingly small. They'd obviously have tweezers because you physically can't get in to pick some of these minute things up. Fish bones would be perfect. When you're going into two concaves, or a convex, like going into a cleavage and trying to stick a tiny piece of stone inside there and then polish it is, to me, quite mind-boggling for when they were doing it. The mosaic of the double-headed serpent is made up of a mixture of carefully cut tiles and tiny random ones. They were stuck down carefully onto a bed of sticky copal resin. If you have enough pieces, you can fit them together, like the selection here. So it's like a jigsaw puzzle. If you have enough pieces, you'll manage to actually put them together. They will look as if they've all been cut as exact fits, but in actual fact, they're pretty randomly chosen, and it's just a matter of arranging them and being nice and careful. And you do have the facility of rubbing them down to be able to get an exact fit. If I had a team of people working on something like the serpent, it would probably have taken six months to make the serpent. But if I was actually having to create all the tiles in the way they did, it would be an open-ended situation of probably a couple of years. The amazing skill of the Aztec craftsmen was not always appreciated, though. As late as the 19th century, some of the mosaics that had reached Europe were regarded as having little value beyond their raw materials. The turquoise mosaics have undergone uh, some subtle but very interesting uh, shifts in terms of how they were perceived. Some were found in a jeweler's workshop in the 19th century uh, in Florence and in Italy, where the jeweler was uh, picking them apart valuing the material, the, the turquoise uh, tesserae or tiles, but barely seeing or registering the object uh, at all. By chance, the double-headed serpent evaded the mosaic butchers. It was perhaps languishing forgotten in a private collection, and so it remained a hidden treasure until public taste was more attuned to its beauty. I think the 19th century is really a pivotal moment because that's when Europe really, for the first time, manages to cast its eyes over the riches and the wonders of the Spanish New World. Uh, they've seen potatoes and tomatoes and tobacco and all these other wonderful uh, produce that they'd never, never really known before. Um, and so they're all curious to find out what their opportunities are there. I mean, let's face it, most people are interested in, in how they can make their own fortunes out of the opening up of the frontiers. One of the first entrepreneurs to get over to the newly independent Mexico was William Bullock, a Liverpool-based jeweler turned showman. He returned from his perilous adventures in the New World with an impressive haul. Some genuine Aztec artifacts some specially made copies, and some human beings. He put all of these on display in his famous museum, known as the Egyptian Hall in Piccadilly. The exhibition really comprised of many different things, including waxwork models of contemporary Mexican rural inhabitants, casts of extraordinary kind of Aztec 
monuments, in particular the Calendar Stone, the large sculpture of Kurt Liquay. Uh, and he also had uh, this extraordinary enormous coiled serpent with a man inside its open gaping mouth. This is not something that's known to archaeologists and art historians to have existed. So quite where he got the idea from or conjured up the idea for creating this thing is not really known. <laughs> Despite or perhaps because of Bullock's fabrications, Aztec fever took a hold of the British public. Before long, so-called real-life Aztecs shipped over from Mexico were even being displayed to Queen Victoria at Buckingham Palace. When Bullock's show was over, the British Museum bought a selection of the sculptures as the basis of its Mexican collection. But the star exhibit was still in hiding. It finally emerged in Italy in the 1890s, where a noblewoman, the Duchessa Massimo, was keen to profit from the public's growing hunger for the lost world of the Aztecs. The Italian Duchess wrote in French to the British Museum. Her comments were perhaps typical of the attitudes of her time. The Mexican serpent has reached me in good condition. It's very curious, though I wouldn't say that it is beautiful. The Duchess was after £120 for the object. The British Museum offered a hundred to have it sent on approval, and she reluctantly accepted. The serpent had finally found a loving home, and in a new century, it would find an ever more appreciative audience. It looks like the most stylish piece of jewellery you've ever seen. I mean, you could imagine Coco Chanel really being very, very pleased with this creation had she manufactured it. Um, it doesn't, it's not a friendly work like a Fabergé egg. It's not a friendly piece of jewellery at all. It's hard um, and it's a machine age work and it's not surprising that double-headed serpents appear, for example, in Art Deco. And I think that many of those do have some sort of affiliation with this one. I think the chords that it strikes with people today is really in trying to understand our own humanity. What is the trajectory of human development? What are the sources of life? What is our relationship to the deities? Human questions that are of concern to all of us. The serpent today sits in isolated splendor as alluring and enigmatic as ever. For all the research, the analysis and the interpretation, it will never reveal all of its secrets. Its scaled, shining surface seems to reflect our questions back at us. In some ways, we're looking at this object with the eyes that the Spanish did. They didn't understand it. They didn't know its significances. They could try and find out. They could try and look into it. But in some ways, it had the same mystery for the Spanish in the 16th century that it has for us now. <laughs>